My name is Megan Ritchie, and I'm one of the Hemonk Pharmacy residents at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. And this is my co-resident, Doug. Hi, everyone. My name is Doug. I'm also uh, co-resident with Megan. Uh, nice to meet everyone. Uh, so today we will be giving you an oncology pharmacist review of vitamin supplements and what they can mean in your cancer care. So the objectives of our presentation are to review the differences between medications, vitamins, and supplements, provide resources so you can critically evaluate dietary supplements and products, explain some safety concerns surrounding vitamins and supplements, and then introduce a list of vitamins and supplements with proven benefit alongside anti-cancer therapy. So first, what is a medication versus what is a vitamin or a supplement? So the purpose, the defined purpose of medications is to prevent, diagnose, and treat disease. And medications are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA. So some examples of medications are both prescription and over-the-counter products. Where vitamins are supplements, their def defined purpose is to augment dietary intake and support the normal structure and function of the body. So because their purpose is to support our normal structure and function, they can legally not claim to prevent, diagnose, or treat disease. And the safety of these supplements is mainly regulated by their manufacturers. So some examples of these are vitamin C, calcium carbonate, and folic acid. To get into the nitty gritty of the differences of regulation and the approval process between medications and vitamins and supplements, first you had the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act for medications, which mandates that the FDA evaluate both the effectiveness and the safety of each medicinal product from scientific evidence that's submitted from manufacturers before the product reaches the market. So whenever a new prescription or over-the-counter medication is being investigated as a possible new product, the manufacturer has to submit data to the FDA that says that this product is both safe and efficacious for whatever disease it's claiming to treat, prevent, or diagnose. And this act gave the FDA authority to issue and enforce quality standards for food, drugs, and medical devices and cosmetics. So the FDA takes a proactive stance on enforcing the quality of medications. Dietary supplements and um, yeah, dietary supplements, on the other hand, are regulated through the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, or DSHEA as the abbreviation. So this act mandated that manufacturers and distribu distributors of dietary supplements and ingredients are responsible for evaluating the safety and labeling of their products before marketing to ensure that they meet FDA regulations. So what that means is that manufacturers don't have to submit data to the FDA when they're investigating a new dietary supplement or vitamin to come on the market. It's up to them to make sure that their going through all the necessary safety and labeling um, processes before putting their product on the market. And I think the key difference here is that safety is the highlight of this product of this process and not necessarily effectiveness of the supplement or vitamin. But this act also gave the FDA the authority to take action against any unsafe dietary supplement products after they reach the market. So it gave the FDA the ability to take a more retrospective um, uh, action on these products. So how can you choose the most quality product when it comes to dietary supplements or vitamins? There's a couple things to look for. The first thing that I look for as a pharmacist is this USP label that should be on whatever vial or box of supplement that you buy. So this USP stands for US Pharmacopeia, and it's a group that publishes manufacturing standards for vitamins and supplements that are actually, actually stricter than FDA standards for these products. So manufacturer participation in this program is voluntary. So you know if they put this label on their product that they conformed to strict manufacturing processes when making their product. 
The other thing that you can do is inspect the product labels. I'm always surprised as a pharmacist how many products have multiple, multiple ingredients in them. And some of the ingredients are okay to take with the, your anti, anti-cancer therapy, and some I have a few concerns about. So whenever you're picking out products, I would always look at the active ingredients and inactive ingredients in each product, as well as the strength or dosing to see if there's anything there that hasn't, that's been recommended against you taking, just depending on what anti-cancer treatment you're going through. And then I've provided some online resources with you all, which I can also post in the chat of this team's um, page. So Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center has a really good website called About Herbs, which I've linked here. It lists the benefits and risks of supplements. So you can type in whatever supplement that you're interested in, and it's going to give you a good evidence-based review from scientific evidence on the supplement that you're interested in on both how it may help or how it may hurt. And then the FDA has a really good dietary supplement consumer information website. So this has general education materials and also important alerts and updates concerning vitamins or supplements. So if the FDA ever takes regulatory action on a supplementary product, they should post it to this page so that the public is aware. There's also news about recalls, warnings, and God forbid health fraud from any manufacturing companies, and then links to other credible resources like the National Institutes of Health if you're interested in finding some um, other credible resources for evaluating supplementary products. So moving on to some specific products, um, I wanted to start with this myth or truth um, statement. So the statement is vitamins and supplements are natural and come from the earth, thus they are good for you. This is a common myth that I hear um, from both patients and online resources that I wanted to try and debunk today with some examples. So the question is, why are supplements problematic, especially from the standpoint of being treated for cancer? Well, they're not always safe in the context of anti-cancer treatment. So as a pharmacist, when a patient comes to me with a supplement or a list of supplements and asks me if it's okay to take with their current anti-cancer therapy, there's a few things that I keep in mind when I'm evaluating the product. The first is how does it interact with the patient's current anti-cancer therapy? So a couple ways that supplements can interact with anti-cancer therapy are either decreasing the action of your anti-cancer drug or increasing the action of your anti-cancer drug through either increasing or decreasing how the body metabolizes your cancer therapy. So if we have decreased action of your anti-cancer drug from a supplement, we worry about a decreased effectiveness of that anti-cancer treatment. And if we have increased action of your anti-cancer therapy, then we could possibly see more side effects as a result of that supplement being on board and interacting with the cancer therapy. And then there are disease interactions that can come along with taking supplements. Um, So for instance, if your organ function has been affected by your disease, the supplement could also further worsen your organ function just depending on what it is. Um, So for example, I have here ginkgo, which is a common supplement that patients are curious about, can have an antiplatelet effect, which means it increases your risk of bleeding, which I would especially be concerned about for somebody who's taking an anti-cancer medication that also lowers the platelets or for somebody who has a disease that lowers your platelets in general. So some specific examples of how anti-cancer therapies can interact with supplements is through oxidative stress. So normally we think that antioxidants are good to take because they decrease inflammation in the body and can help with some discomforts there. But a lot of our cancer treatments actually work through putting oxidative stress on the cancer cells and the healthy cells as well, which is where we get some side effects. So normally we want that oxidative stress killing the cancer cell, but if we take antioxidants like vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, or selenium, 
they can actually counteract that oxidative stress that we want the cancer therapy to be having on the cell and then possibly decreasing the effectiveness of the chemotherapy or maybe oral oncolytic that you're taking. Another example is um, methotrexate and how it works with the folate pathway in the body. So methotrexate is a common anti-cancer therapy and it works to counteract the action of folate in the body, therefore stopping DNA and RNA synthesis in the cell and eventually um, causing the cell itself. However, if you give folate or folic acid, which is a common supplement, or vitamin B9, it can counteract that action of methotrexate, and then you don't have the cell killing that you want from the methotrexate. Now, folic acid can be beneficial when given with other types of chemotherapy. It's actually been proven to be that way, um, which is why it's always a good idea to ask your oncologist or your pharmacist whether the chemotherapy or other anti-cancer therapy that you're taking is okay to use with folic acid. And then some side effects that supplements themselves can have. I wanted to give you a list of some common ones that I've seen in practice. Uh, licorice root can cause high blood pressure and low potassium levels. DHEA can possibly have proestrogenic effects, which would be concerning for me um, with someone with a cancer that's estrogen dependent, like certain breast cancers or certain ovarian cancers. Kava Kava is a common supplement that can cause liver damage, same with green tea extracts. And then black cohosh can also cause liver damage and those proestrogenic effects. And then garlic, ginger, and ginkgo, I usually think of the three Gs, are the ones that can cause an antiplatelet effect and an increased risk of bleeding. So those are some um, evaluative processes I go through as a pharmacist when I'm looking at these supplements and some concerns that I have. And then Doug is going to take the more positive spin and talk about some supplements that are beneficial in cancer treatment. Okay, we're just flipping over the computer so you guys can see me now. <laughs> um, that was a lovely overview, Megan. Um, I'm going to go through kind of those positive benefits, supplement benefits with uh, vitamins um, that she mentioned. So uh, we just wanted to give you guys a brief overview of these proposed benefits that we see and some things that we think about when we're, um, you know, reviewing vitamins and supplements when people are on um anti-cancer therapy and stuff like that. So some vitamins and supplements, as they may have anti-cancer, they may have anti-toxicity properties. However, there is insufficient um, evidence to make recommendations on these proposed mechanisms. Um, some of the products that may support and maintain bodily functions while on chemotherapy and anti-cancer medications. Um, we want to mention, and this is definitely our highest recommendation, to always discuss any vitamins, supplements, minerals, and herbal products with your oncology team, including the pharmacist. You know, we're getting these questions very frequently, and what we do is really take a look at whatever herbs, herbals, minerals, supplements, vitamins, and make sure they don't interact with anything, as Megan kind of walked you guys through. And some things that might um, alarm us to say this might affect the therapy that we know is proven to give benefit in controlling the disease. So it's a big point to just mention that, you know, you always want to run these paths with your oncology team and including your pharmacist. Sometimes the risks of vitamin supplements may outweigh the proposed benefit too. Okay, so I'm going to go through a couple of, you know, more common vitamins um, that we'll see in uh, vitamin D, calcium, B12, vitamin B12, and folic acid or vitamin B9. So these are some lists that are shown to have proposed benefits um, with uh, anti-cancer therapy. To start off, vitamin D. Um, so this kind of walks through some of the background and the proposed benefits that we might see with vitamin D. It's an essential fat-soluble vitamin. It comes in different forms, ergocalciferol vitamin D2 and colcalciferol vitamin B D3. The D2 is plant-derived, um, and then the main function of this is to control serum calcium and phosphorus concentrations by increasing um, intestinal calcium absorption. So some of the claims that has shown possible effectiveness 
including osteoporosis when it's in uh, combination and used with calcium, possibly uh, effective in allergic rhinitis or like hay fever. But we do have insufficient evidence when it comes to cancer prevention, seasonal affective disorder, and immunity. Calcium, um, this is an essential nutrient. It also comes in different forms, including calcium carbonate and calcium citrate. Carbonate, the other brand name you might know it as, is Tums, and citrate as citrus, citricale. This helps, uh, works as a major component of the bone matrix and helps fortify that bone. It's effective in dyspepsia, so with calcium carbonate. It's likely effective with osteoporosis when we use it in combination in vitamin D, and that's what I'll focus on um, on the next slide of um, this combination of both those um, agents. So that might be something that we recommend for you to be on to help support your bone health, uh, vitamin D and calcium. Could be possibly effective in hypertension, and we do have insufficient evidence for cancer prevention purposes. So this slide uh, kind of goes through that importance of vitamin D and calcium supplementation. So when do we recommend this supplementation combination? So this we see in patients who are on bone modifying agents, including zoledronic acid and denosumab or Exgiva or Prolia. Um, and again, the general theme here is to help support bone health. So this is in addition to some of the medications that you might be on from your oncologist, and we do recommend that this supplement be taken in combination with that. So other purposes, we could see it in breast cancer when patients are on aromatase inhibitors or anti-estrogens. Again, we're using this to help fortify bone health. Also in prostate cancer, when we see some of our androgen deprivation therapy, um, some of those, all these medications are listed just for I, FYI and for your information um, if you, you know, happen to come across or see those. And then also we can use when patients are on high doses of corticosteroids for a prolonged period of time. Um, so our recommended dosing here, calcium anywhere from 500 to 600 milligrams twice a day. In vitamin D, about 800 to 1,000 micrograms or 25 units by mouth daily. Sometimes you can see on the bottle, as we saw with the last picture, it could be in micrograms or units. So just making sure to check to make sure you have the right product, but it should have both on that label. Next is vitamin B12 uh, or cyanocobalamin. So this is an essential water soluble vitamin. It helps, it's required for protein synthesis, cell reproduction and normal growth and helps produce uh, normal red blood cells. It has been shown to be effective in B12 deficiency. Also something I'll quickly talk about is a certain chemotherapy called pemetrexid or uh, Olympta. Um, so it helps to prevent tox side effects with that drug possibly effective for canker sores, post-herpetic neuralgia as well, but there is insufficient evidence to say that it helps prevent cancer or any type of chemotherapy-induced neuropathy or anxiety. Also, vitamin B9 or folic acid or folate. So this is another essential water-soluble vitamin. Uh, it's needed for making certain enzymes in your me metabolic systems um, that are required for that protein synthesis and also helping with red blood cell production. Effective for patients who are deficient in folate, and then also that hemotrexid um, side effect, de decreasing the side effect of that. Could be possibly effective with another agent that Megan had mentioned, methotrexate, and this could be used for rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis as well. We've seen some evidence may be possibly effective for cognitive impairment or even depression, but there is insufficient evidence with cancer prevention too. So again, as I mentioned uh, very briefly, this Pemetrexid, it's another type of chemotherapy agent where we see vitamin B12 and folic acid supplementation. So this is really to help prevent side effects that we see with your uh, blood levels or, or blood cells. Um, to, and also um, in helps to prevent any type of infection that might happen too, or other side effects that we see with this specific chemotherapy. Um, so the dosing was included there, but it's very, it's a very niche uh, chemotherapy. Um, so I've just included it there as another proposed benefit that we have walked through. Um, so folic acid can be dosed anywhere from 400 to 1000 micrograms by mouth daily. And then vitamin B12, we actually give it as an intramuscular injection. Um, anywhere every three weeks or so, or every nine weeks, excuse me. 
So this was just kind of an overview of the some of the supplements and vitamins that we um, have seen. We have shown uh, potential benefit when people are on anti-cancer therapy and helping with reducing side effects and also help promoting bone health, specifically with vitamin D and calcium. Um, we appreciate all uh, the time. And at this point, we're happy to take any questions. I'm sure there's some questions in the chat too, um, but please, uh, we can look at those questions. But um, if you wanted to unmute yourself, um, then feel free to ask us uh, any questions that you guys may have. First yeah. question. Oh, Ooh. go ahead. You see the chat questions. Okay, awesome. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully you can see us both. Um, I think so. Our chairs are bulky over here. I know. <laughs> So first question in the chat is if we can talk about vitamins and their interaction with tamoxifen. Um, so really good question. I think there's probably too many vitamins in the repertoire of vitamins in general to talk about all of them. Um, but first thing I think about with tamoxifen is the risk of blood clots. So I would be worried about patients taking any vitamins or supplements that also increase the risk of blood clots with tamoxifen. Um, as well as any that could compromise bone health as well, since that's um, a general concern with tamoxifen. So for people who are on tamoxifen, like, like Doug Slide has, um, I would recommend a calcium and vitamin D supplement. Um, anything else would just have to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Do you yeah. have anything to add? Yeah, and to add to, so tamoxifen, it gets uh, metabolized in your body through the liver. Mm -hmm. So as Megan and I can kind of go through our slides here real quick. As she mentioned, with some of the effects that some vitamins and supplements may have on the metabolism of the drug, it can either cause potentially less drug to be available in the body to like kind of treat the cancer, or it can lead to certain side effects too. So it, yeah, as Megan said, it's very case by case basis. And hence why you come to your pharmacist when you have all you know, supplements and vitamins that you um, are potentially um, considering taking to uh, really uh, run it through us first, because sometimes tamoxifen, although yet yeah, metabolized through the liver, some of these supplements can really affect that and could cause potential harm or less effect that we want to get out of the treatment. Mm -hmm. um, next question I see in the chat, what is the difference between oral vitamins versus liquid meal supplements? So I'm assuming by liquid meal supplements, we mean like Ensure and other products like that, um, which can certainly contain vitamins along with the macronutrients that they provide. So really the difference between the oral vitamin supplements themselves and then what's contained in, in Ensure or another liquid meal supplement like that. Uh, first thing I think of is the dose of the vitamin that's in each. Um, I think usually with those liquid supplements, the vitamins are a bit less concentrated than they are if you took them in a capsule or a pill or um, even like a liquid concentrated solution. Um, so you can compare those products, I think, pretty easily if you look at the um the supplement labels. Each one should have a breakdown of the vitamins and minerals that they contain, as well as the amount of each one, either in milligrams, micrograms, units, um, just depending on what kind of vitamin that it is. Um, and certain macronutrients too um, can interact as well, which is why we always partner very closely with our dietitians when recommending um, meal supplements. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I think that, that was great. Okay. Um, next question, can collagen be taken with estrogen positive breast cancer on aromatase inhibitor medications? So uh, I've heard some alarming data about, college, about collagen in the estrogen receptor positive breast cancer space. So as a blanket statement, I would avoid taking collagen while on therapy for that. And then does tart cherry juice help with pain from aromatase inhibitor medications and is it safe? Tart cherry juice off the top of my head isn't one that I'm familiar with. I would have to consult my resources. Um, happy to look into that and provide an answer to Ashley so she can distribute that to the group. Um, but also any specific supplements that come to mind after this presentation. Uh, your oncology team should be happy to answer those too if you shoot them on my chart message. Yeah, I think it, 
you know, when we do our check, when we're like looking at if uh, tart cherry juice would be appropriate, would be kind of like looking into this slide here too, of just making sure that, you know, it's not affecting the metabolism of certain drugs, doesn't, you know, cause any types of other side effects that we may see, um, potentially more so if like we know the certain drug too that the anti-cancer drug you're taking may also cause some side effects. So that's another thing to consider. Let's say if, you know, tart cherry juice, if it caused certain side effects and then the anti-cancer drug caused those same side effects, it could be actually, you know, make you feel worse than that. So those are some other things that we'll take, we could take a look at when we, you know, do a review. Yeah. The next question, is turmeric safe to be taken alongside tamoxifen? Turmeric is a supplement that I very commonly get questions about. Um, it does have a few properties that interact with anti-cancer medications, which are appealing from you know, a, a cancer standpoint, but it can interact with your medications. So tamoxifen, I worry about that increased risk of bleeding. I also worry about it um, from the oxidative stress standpoint because it is a good antioxidant. Um, and I also worry about it interacting with the drug's metabolism in the body. Um, so with tamoxifen specifically, I would recommend against using turmeric. Definitely, you know, amounts that you put in your meal to spice things up is totally fine. I would just recommend against taking concentrated turmeric supplements like in a pill or something like that because it can interfere with how tamoxifen is metabolized in the body. Yeah, I think that's a good point to bring up too, is like, you know, certain things that we put in food is okay to still take and do. We're not saying you like eliminate that from your diet, but when things are in pill form or a liquid form, they're highly concentrated. So they have more of the chance to have those effects on the anti-cancer treatment or therapy. Mm -hmm. And another question about estrogen positive breast cancer, how about soy? Um, so soy along the same lines with turmeric, it's okay in normal dietary amounts, as long as soy isn't like your whole diet. So I'd be a little worried if you're eating like tofu, edamame, and soy milk every day. But you know, if you have a little tofu every once in a while, that's fine. Soy does have some pro-estrogenic effects to it. So if you have estrogen positive or estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, which is dependent on that estrogen in the body, I would be wary of using soy in concentrated amounts. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, I don't see any other questions. Yeah, yet. that looks like everything. Yeah. Um, Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you guys very much for your time this morning. Um, and to anyone in attendance still, if you want to go ahead and put anything in the chat, I'll keep it up for about 10 more minutes and I can certainly pass that along. Um, and I'll, you can see here too, we did put some links in the chat as well that were discussed during the presentation. So if you want to click on those, feel free. Um, and if you guys have any other questions, you know how to reach me. Um, so yeah, I'll leave this chat up a little bit. And if you, there's anything else, um, We'll go hey, from Ashley, there, but yeah. Uh, quick question. Um, sure. You know, everything that was shared was very, very helpful. So thank you very much. Um, when you say talk to your pharmacist, right? Is it really when you go and fill the prescription? And this may be a very stupid question. Or do I talk to my oncologist and there's pharmacist as part of the provider group that work through? Because that's one of the things that I'm struggling with. Mm -hmm. Like, who do I sit down and really make a list of things? And what works for me personally? Yeah, good question. Should have been more specific about that. Um, so especially if you're treated at Northwestern, most of our cancer clinics have a pharmacist embedded in the clinic that's reviewing all the patients that are seen by all the oncologists in those clinics. So we recommend talking to one of those pharmacists that's trained in hematology and oncology, like Doug and I are being trained this year. Um, so if you reach out to your provider over my chart, that mm -hmm. message can go to their nurse. And if it has to do with supplements, vitamins, anything like that, the nurse is going to transfer it straight to the pharmacist who covers their team. So we can review the medication list that way. Otherwise, when you go to see your oncologist, if you're interested in talking to the pharmacist in clinic, just ask and we're happy to pop in the room and have a conversation with you.